Welcome. It is a uh, Freaky Friday, and it's also a uh, Friends and Family Friday today. Um, we are coming live from the Corona Bunker Studios. As you can see, I was uh, prepared to play golf today after the show. Unfortunately, if you take a look outside, it's uh, a torrential downpour here in New York. The uh, skies have opened, the winds are blowing, the sea is ornery today, my friends. And uh, there will be no golf for John, but I did want to show off one of my new golf shirts, which is kind of cool, if you ask me. Overstock.com, up another 4 bucks at 49 The stock's going to 100 if you want to take a look at that one. Uh, Dow up 200 looking good today, 25 9 For those of you out there who want to be uh, playing the market to the upside, which I don't think you should be, um, a close above 26,000 today could be very good news, and a close below 26, any number with a 2-5 in the beginning of it uh, could spell trouble from a technical standpoint next week. Um, many people are reporting that uh, the Fed is still in control. The more they keep the uh, loose money policy going, the more people want to be in stocks. I myself personally, as I've told you many times, I'm short a number of individual stocks. But I do like the macros of the market. If Trump gets reelected, November, December, whew, bomb ditty. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we got a couple of regular guests that come on every Friday, and they're both going to be here. Michael Johns is going to be here, and uh, he's one of the co-founders of the Tea Party movement. And also uh, our good buddy, uh, funny man himself on Funny Fridays, uh, Barry Goldsmith, joins us a little later in hour two to crack you up. Um, I will be here for most of the show. I intend um, to take a segment or two off today completely because my alter ego, John Cronkite, will be here a little later on in the show. And um, I may just take a segment off me and John Cronkite and leave the camera on Nico and Jess, who are standing by. Uh, Jess, of course, has curly hair today, so she's in a bad mood. And um, there's Nico. Now, you see, now uh, that we have this camera on the control room, now Nico's coming in all Rico suave out. He's got the hair slicked back, looking good. Um, now, if you just play as good as you look, then <laughs> we'll be in good hands. All right. Um, lots to... <laughs> I got a whole page of notes here from Barry Goldsmith of all the jokes that he's going to crack you up with today. Uh, I'm cracking up about this. I'm cracked up already from being in the Corona Bunker. By the way, today I'm drinking Captain Morgan and Coke. Um, we had yesterday a liquid lunch. As you know, I had multiple martinis. And then there was a whole soiree of people in my house, and we continued to have liquid dinner. And then we went to play bocce at the waterside and had uh, evening, liquid evening, and liquid night. And somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning, Todd and I were eating chocolate-covered entomon donuts and dunking them in milk. But uh, a little bit of a headache this morning, but uh, no headache at all to sit right here breeze through these next two hours. Thanks for joining me. Um, <clears throat> Dabby Carreras is a great friend of mine, and he was uh, one of the first fan family and friends to ask to come on Friends Friday. And um, Dabby's going to be with us uh, right after this. The Zoom room is open. We have a boatload of guests who are always a, a boatload of fans and friends out there that are watching every day. My family's watching every day. Congrats to my uh, cousin Drea's daughter, Noli, who graduated yesterday, and uh, she's thrilled, and uh, I'm thrilled for her. Congrats to her and her whole class of 2020. And um, Dabby's a Wall Street guy. Okay, he's into the markets. He usually doesn't agree with me, so we may have a good little mix it up. But uh, check out what's going on right here, okay? Um, if you want to come on the show, you're always on the feed. You're always sending me comments, questions. People send me memes all the time. Email Nico. I want to have you on the show today. Coming back right after this with Dabby Carreras. All right, welcome back. Uh, just kicking off Freaky Friday and uh, came up with an ingenious plan because I love my audience and all my friends out there. I don't like calling them fans. I call them friends because I try to open my heart and mind and expose all the uh, 
dents and dings on me and uh, let people get to know me. And at least they know what I'm talking about. And they know what's behind it, what I'm about. Um, take a lighter look at things sometimes, every so often, which I think is good to do. And uh, I love having a dialogue with all my friends that watch the show frequently. And people send me comments. They give me tons of content for the show. Um, and I'm always talking about the market and how things are going out there. And one of my uh, dear friends who's... Uh, been part of the uh, Tobacco Morano circle for quite some time. Dabby Carreras joins us right now. He's a Wall Street veteran. He's a uh, tremendous friend of the show. He's always there supporting us and stuff. Dabby, how are you, brother? Awesome, actually. Uh, just watching this uh, storm coming in from uh, the balcony, so to speak. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. Oh, yeah. I'm waving wow. at you. I'm seeing you right there. I think uh, Staten Island Boat's running right out to you. Wow, where are you? In downtown Manhattan? Yeah, wow, absolutely. So great it's nice. Great looking view. So, Dabby, um, me and you tend to mix it up every so often down in Bobby Vans uh, over a couple of absolutely. martinis. Um, tell the audience, I mean, I'm not a financial advisor. I say it all the time. But, I mean, you are one of the best of them. And, uh, you know, Thank my, you. My, Thank thoughts, you. my thoughts are, as I've been saying for a while on the show, is I'm short a bunch of names that I don't think are recoverable. Uh, Simon Property Group, uh, Macy's, Gap Stores, um, uh, Brookfield Asset Management, uh, AMC Theaters. These are single stock names that I think, you know, the utilization of their spaces is going to be 25% or 50%. These are all companies that will, like, struggling to thrive at 100%. So I feel like there are pot shots in the market that I can still do what I do best and get short. Um, but I actually think that the market, you know, once the once the election is settled, either way, I think the market goes higher. What, how are you feeling about it? I think you're right. There's a lot of confusion going around. I mean, if you look at this morning, you see Carnival flying up. I mean, I don't think people realize they're not going anywhere. Their boats are not leaving places and running around. The, the traffic is seeing are tankers, but yet the stock's flying up. Uh, people are going to go on their first vacation, so I think it's going to be great. But yeah, there's a lot of empty calories and a lot of different names that you just mentioned. I mean, very speculative, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, the rules have changed and we have seen such amazing things happen with e-commerce, so... Who knows? Yeah, so um, as you know, and some of my audience, those are just tuning in, I worked for Overstock.com for like 15 years. I'm a big shareholder in Overstock.com. Um, the stock three months ago was four bucks. And uh, the, the pandemic actually had a tremendously huge effect on Overstock. Trading today at 49, up yeah. 10x through the, uh, up 10x through the pandemic, and it seems like the Wayfairs and the Amazons and everything, this has really been like a, this has really been like an accelerant on people who hadn't already adopted, you know, e-commerce. Now everybody's Absolutely. Doing it. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that Overstock has a great way to have for the, the blockchain and Bitcoin kind of space. And you never really see people get overastically enthusiastic, excuse me, for gold. But it's really... When there's no real direction and people don't know, I mean, look, we're seeing um, a lot of confusion at all different levels, at legislative and and really economic. Like I said, the rules have changed in the theories. So a lot of things are really up for grabs for people who are looking to work and things that are making sense at the end of the day. And, you know, if you have a business that's selling and has uh, uh, growth, that's not empty calories, it makes sense. Give people yeah. out there across the country an idea of what you see in downtown. There's no term in finance called defunding. Either you fund something or you don't fund something. So when you say defunding, what you're really saying is removing. And I don't really understand how you can remove police um, because yeah, people we are going to just hire security. So it's it's a little dangerous, but... You know, you, you got to be careful. You got to be quiet. You got to be uh, mind yourself. And, and uh, you know, you follow social distancing rules, really. I, I think that's the best way to say. But it's uh, not someplace that it's apocalyptic that people should not, not yet. have to not worry. Not yet. All right. Well, you got to keep us posted. Thank you so much for calling in, bro. Love seeing you. And uh, 
Hopefully one of these days we'll get to uh, clank some martinis together again real soon. Please. All right. Can't wait. That's uh, Thank you, John. Dabby Carreras, great friend of the show. You're watching Liquid Lunch on Biz TV. We're going to take a quick break. Come back with some more news of the day right after this. Five, four, three, two. Greetings and salutations from rainy Staten Island. I'm John Tobacco coming to you from the Corona Bunker Studios right here in Staten Island, New York, in my living room. There is, uh, as you can see outside, the sea is ornery today. Um, waves are coming in, winds are coming in, tropical storm headed our way. We're battening down the hatches. Um, and we're going to uh, continue to quarantine, I assume. Um, as I mentioned, uh, across the country, we are seeing this movement, the defund the police movement. And uh, I continue to feel like, you know, they're shooting the messenger, going after the police. They should be going after prosecutors and uh, DA's offices that squander money and waste tons of dough on travel and all this other crap. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about that more and more because it's not the cops. The cops are the street soldiers, okay? It's the prosecutors and the DA's offices that are calling balls and strikes on what they want to prosecute. And uh, right here in New York, you have, um, you know, people being prosecuted um, for crazy crimes that are almost not even crimes. Um, and at the same time, they got people looting and rioting and breaking into stores and things and, you know, bashing cops and lighting cop cars on fire. And uh, actually, some kids vandalized the uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral, one of the you know most famous, you know, attractions on Earth. Um, and they got caught on tape and they got caught and then the DA decides not to prosecute. So if they're not going to prosecute and there's cashless bail, if you prosecute them, they get bail, they get out with no money. Well, we don't really need that many DAs. We just need them to, you know, track down the big cases, the murders and the bank robberies and stuff, and uh, leave the rest of civilization to us. I mean, you want mayhem, that's the way to do it. Um, but here in Staten Island, New York, um, Richmond County, as it's referred to, um, the highest percentage of votes for Donald Trump in the 2016 Republican primary, 82% of Staten Island voted for Donald Trump, okay? Number one in the whole country, not in New York City, not in New York State, in the whole country. This is Trump country like you cannot believe, okay? And uh, you know what? People in Trump country like um, cops because we respect the blue. And uh, the blue's been getting the crap beat out of him. And uh, my buddy Scott Labedo, and I tried to help in every way that I can. Uh, but Scott got together a beautiful art installation, um, kind of playing off Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. And so do blue lives too. Okay? Um, and he made that in a hundred foot art piece, which was amazing. Okay? And uh, the grand poobah of Staten Island politics, the, 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 the pierce de resistance of uh, someone who stands up for our community with principles, um, our New York State legislator, New York State Senator Andrew Lanza was on hand, along with Mike Riley, Nicole Maltakis, Mike Tanus, a lot of electeds were there showing their support for the blue. So remember that in November, the people that go stand in front of a precinct and support the blue, boost the blue, boost their morale, Remember those people, okay? Um, and remember this, for those of you here in New York, this congressional race this year, um, they're talking about Trump's gonna lose. Don't, don't even buy into any of that crap, okay? Well, Trump's going to win in ways that they can't even imagine. That's why they're pulling this plot on us to keep Donald Trump away from rallying, to expose Joe Biden by putting him in debates, they want it all in mail-in voting so they could fix it, fraud it, and all that other stuff. This is going to clean up, okay? And Trump is going to lay a whooping on him. And then you're going to see a man unshackled 
um, because he doesn't have to run again after that. So he's going to be on fire, if you ask me. And they know that. That's why they want to stop him now so badly, okay? Um, but you know what? Someone who can speak for all people, who's open-minded and objective, is my good buddy Andrew Lanza, New York State Senator. He was on hand at the uh, Booster Blue rally the other night, and uh, I caught up with him for a few minutes. And uh, here's a little bit of what Andrew has to say about uh, Boosting the Blue. All right, what's up, Liquid Lunch? I'm out on the streets tonight. Yep, in my home borough, Staten Island. We're hitting the streets to support the blue. This isn't anything to do with anti-BLM. Our cops are getting beat down to the ground. They need their morale boosted. Great friend of Liquid Lunch, Scott Lebedo, put together the Boost the Blue morale rally. I call it a morale. And uh, we're lucky enough to find uh, the greatest advocate in our community, law and order man himself, once a prosecutor, an attorney, and our state senator, Andrew Lance. Well, how great is this? This is awesome. You know, to see the turnout here, we're standing in front of the 122nd police precinct here on Staten Island. To see the turnout well, here on the sidewalk as cars have gone, gone by for the last two hours, showing their support for the police department. John, I know you. Look at this. This is awesome. Uh, you heard the crowd getting crazy there. Uh, audio a little sketchy, but um, you know what? At a time in our country <clears throat> when people are afraid to speak up, we keep hearing about the silent majority, the silent majority, it's easy for a politician to squeeze his way out of showing his face at something that is against the BLM movement, the defund the police movement. But there's Andrew Lanza up there. Um, and he and I are both sons of cops. Our fathers were friends, okay? We know each other since we're 12 years old and uh, went to the same high school. And uh, we share a lot of the same values. And uh, we talked about that. Check this out. I've been friends for 13 years. Uh, since we're 13 years old. And this guy has known right from wrong since day one. And so I know this really warms his heart to see this. It warms my heart. You know, we're here because we know one thing. The greatest police department on earth is right here in New York City. The men and women of the New York City Police Department are the greatest police on planet Earth. Without them, all is lost. We depend on them for our safety, and we're seeing this assault on America, assault on our police. Defunding police is the most disgusting, outrageous, ridiculous thing that I've seen in my life. And we're here to say we love the police department. We need the police department. In fact, we need them more than they need us. And we want to be out here showing our support because we know that this is about taking our freedom away. They hate the police department because they want our freedom. They hate America because they want our freedom. That's their ultimate goal. This is a Marxist revolution. And we're here to say God bless America. God bless the men and women of the New York City Police Department. You know what? Uh, I'm proud to be his friend. I'm proud to know him my whole life. I'm proud he represents me and my family here because I know what he's about. And it's, it takes, some, it takes some, some gumption, I'll just say, um, to get on national TV as an elected official and say, God bless the NYPD. That's like a mouthful for the woke crowd. You mentioned God and the police in the same sentence. Oh, my God. We should bring in John Cronkite uh, and get his liberal spin on these things. Nah, that's not happening. He's out today. And I'm doing rum and coke today. I'm switching it up a little because it's a little cloudy. So it's like uh, I used to live in Bermuda and um, I used to drink the dark and stormies. Um, so I'm going to do some dark and stormies today because of the stormy weather. I even had to pull down the flag because uh, I lowered it because the wind was almost ripping the pole over. It's crazy out there. More Liquid Lunch for you right after this, and uh, more from Andrew Lanza a little later on in the show. Michael Johns is going to be here right after this. Barry Goldsmith is going to be with us. You're there. I'm here. Stay put. Have a drink. Be right back. Hey, all right, welcome back. Just uh, zipping right through the first hour here and uh, a lot of talk about the markets, what's happening, a lot of uncertainty out there. 
came into the hour today with the market up almost 300. Um, now spitting back some of those gains as uh, the market's only up 150. And uh, we'll keep a watch uh, throughout the show today if it uh, can pop its head above 26,000, which will be a very good uh, technical uh, setup, if you ask me. It's just one of my theories. But uh, close below 25 could be bad news. And Bitcoin is teetering on 9,100 here. And uh, below nine, Look out, but I think nine has been locked in. It's been bouncing around between nine and 10. That's called support. When it's at a range for a while, um, and when it goes up, um, if something bad happens and it comes down, it would fall technically to its last support level. Um, so the longer it stays in a range with good fundamentals around it, you're building a solid base for it to rock it up off of. Um, we, uh, every Friday, get lucky and have uh, our good buddy Michael Johns joins us. He's a commentator, policy analyst, and writer, former speech writer for President George H.W. Bush, one of the co-founders of the Tea Party movement. And uh, if anybody knows about you know starting a movement that changed America, at least put it on a new path, uh, it's this guy. And uh, Mike, it seems like China's really trying to change Hong Kong, uh, and the way they're crushing these activists is, is really bad news. Well, um, we have a president, I think, who, uh, for the first time in a long time, really understands the magnitude and the breadth of the threat that, that uh, communist China uh, presents both to the United States and the world. And uh, predictably, I guess, for those of us who have been uh, kind of negative on, on the Communist Party of China, but maybe shockingly for those who haven't been, they've really been taking advantage of the world's distraction with the uh, pandemic to exert their their regional power and influence. The most prominent, as you correctly pointed out, is in Hong Kong, where they have violated a treaty that was signed um, the, to provide for Hong Kong's uh, incorporation into China, but to maintain its political independence for 50 years. Halfway through this agreement, the Communist Party, after the you know, after seeing momentum building in Hong Kong for, for freedom and for even independence, uh, met in secret, violated this agreement, put forward this national security law that now threatens uh, Hong Kong residents with life in prison uh, for, you know, the most vague offenses, including, um, you know, sedition and, and uh, political opposition, collaboration or um, with the uh, Western or other governments that essentially sh is designed and may have the effect, in fact, of shutting down what is the one of the largest democracy movements of modern times in Hong Kong. Um, the other thing that's really been, you know, getting to me more and more is, you know, and we've been talking about it, you and I, is this uh, COVID stuff, the COVID cover-ups and you know how you know one day mask one day no mask in this kind of pandemic is kind of taking away our rights in, in a big way uh how bad is this cover-up do you think mike it appears it was it appeared horrible uh, a month or six weeks ago it is now emerging to be even worse than we thought it was um the most prominent recent example is the fact that we were all led to believe the World Health Organization said this, Communist Party of China's spokespeople said this, that they had notified the World Health Organization uh, late, um, you know, into, late into, into 2020, but they at least had notified them about the transmittability and the pandemic potential of uh, COVID. It now turns out that there really was never any notification to the World Health Organization. And as you and I have talked about before, um, you know, this organization has been run by a former Ethiopian health minister, not even a physician, who essentially has been operating for quite a long time as a pawn of communist China. And it's clear that uh, uh, the Communist Party in China did everything it could to contain the pandemic within Wuhan province while they simultaneously allowed individuals to fly all over the world, including to the United States, um, you know, with what motive? I mean, I guess the most cynical person would say to actually damage the economies and um, even the security of, of foreign countries, including the United States. And, you know, if you want to give them a benefit of the doubt, I guess, acted uh, irresponsibly or 
unstrategically, but um, I think many of us, this administration included, which has really some great China advisors um, like Peter Navarro uh, doing fantastic work, uh, I think really understands that what we've got in the Communist Party of China is what's called an enemy. And we just simply haven't sort of come around over the last few decades to describing it in that way. And it's a different enemy. It's not like the Soviet Union, a traditional, you know, sort of global military power. The military uh, confrontation, including in, particularly in the South China Sea, is increasingly a big part of this. It's been an economic war. It's been a informational and propaganda war. It's been an infiltration war. I mean, what communist China has done to infiltrate American universities uh, to establish their so-called Confucius Institutes, which have, you know, really provided an immense pro-Beijing propaganda in these universities. Yeah, hey, Mike, what about, um, you know, lightly reported, if at all, but I've been saying it for months now, you got this Harvard professor um, who was arrested for taking like, you know, five million bucks from China. Um, the, he ran like the microbiology department at Harvard and they caught him at an airport, like trying to get out of the country. And then two, two people he was working with in that scholars program um, turned out to be Chinese nationalists who were actually intelligence agents. So does Harvard... Um, have some hand in in this? Why would the FBI lock up a Harvard professor who's a bio, microbiologist? Well, because in essence, we have individuals in some of the most elite universities in our country um, conspiring and collaborating with the Communist Party of China to violate intellectual property uh, uh, agreements and to share technology secrets and sometimes even national security secrets when these individuals are engaged with the U.S. government. This is a vast um, barrel of problems that we're only now beginning to unearth. I believe over the next year, uh, incrementally, you're going to see many more of these cases unearthed. The FBI is currently engaged, John, in uh, thousands of investigations in the United States as it relates to communist collusion with Communist Party officials in China designed to aid Communist China at the expense of the United States of America. So we have a huge issue, and it's a broad issue. I mean, there's almost like no component of this relationship that isn't broken, which makes it very difficult. You know, I was doing a piece on this uh, TikTok app that all yep. the kids have, this TikTok app. Turns out that the U.S. government has an advisory out to all military members that they're forbidden to download it on their phones. And... Uh, People think because TikTok is a U.S. company with a U.S. CEO that it's all or not China, but turns out they own TikTok, and when they get in, and when they get in your kid's phone, they get in that phone, they get anything they want, they get into your email, they get into your house, they can get into your alarm system just by getting into one phone on TikTok. Two billion people in the world have TikTok on their phone, so China actually controls one third of the world's phones right now, which is damn scary to me. It is immensely frightening, and obviously this, um, you know, entire new generation of telephones, they've been hugely involved in, and, and we need to be uh, very uh, strong on this issue. Um, and in fact, on TikTok, which is interesting, you know, India kind of set an example there. Um, th as part of this regional aggression, there, of which there's multiple components, Taiwan's a part of it. If this application, which is broadly used, is not secure, to the consumers that are using it, it has to be banned. I just don't, and-, and No any, question, no any, question. Any technological app or product that's coming out of Communist China at this part, it's sad to say, but you have to be honest about it, is it cannot be trusted at this juncture, at the state of this relationship. And I will say this, you Absolutely. might say, well, our relationship's deteriorating on Trump's watch. No, it's just that Trump is unearthing beginning to talk about issues that have been going on. Yeah, for yeah that's right. Yeah. Hey, all right. We got to pick it up again next week. Mike, thanks so much. That's uh, Michael <laughs> Johns, co-founder of the Tea Party, speechwriter for George H.W. Bush. And uh, Friendly Friday continues with a special guest right after this. Welcome back, folks. I've been taking my makeup off every day. With... Uh, with the coronavirus waves, I'm still.
a funny Friday. I tell you, this spiced rum, boy, it is good. Um, I may turn this segment over to uh, John Cronkite and uh, go sit over there and have a uh, rum and coke. But uh, I have been playing around lately with, you know, this alter ego news person voice. And, um, you know, if you really want a solid gold newsman, um, I we got the best in the business on our team, that's for sure. My buddy uh, joins us right now in a special guest appearance today. He, and he's always with us in spirit. But Frank Morano joins us on Zoom from the car as he's Zooming home. How are you, pal? That's right. That's right. I'm trying to beat uh, Tropical Storm Faye uh, as I race home uh, to accomplish the very important task of taking a nap prior to departing for America's Playground, Atlantic City, where I hope I will see some of our viewers tonight or tomorrow. I know Susan Rochester Zaccone is coming out there tonight. Susan, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the lobby bar at the Ocean. And uh, I believe um, tomorrow we're going to see both Loren Conlon and uh, Zen Sams. So looking forward to seeing you guys. And uh, it should be quite an interesting crowd all around. All right, so Frank... A couple things I need your help with. First of all, I know you've been popping in when you can and watching, and your advice is, you know, always the best. But um, right. I have been trying as much as I can to spread the word about all your new great uh, things you're starting, the different shows and all that stuff. And I see, like, an outpouring of love for you on social media and everything that, you know, I think you're just, I think you're just about to blow up. I think they say the kids hashtag about to blow up. No, is that it, Jess? Well, uh, who knows? But I, I will. I will tell you this, John. Uh, I appreciate mentioning that I'm starting my new program on WABC uh, this Sunday from seven to nine p.m., uh, which I'm very excited about. I'm not quite sure what I'm do. Yeah, yeah. You could go. You can go. Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do yet, but um, I will tell you this. You know, you've seen this, John that whenever you do something that's in the public eye, you see people going out of their way to slam you for past misconduct or past alleged misconduct. Oh, so what yeah. I'm going to do uh, this Sunday, like let's say people don't like an interview I do or an opinion I give, you know, they might say, oh, what does Frank know? He was once blank. Um, so what I am going to do this Sunday is I all of my haters the trouble. And this Sunday, between 7 and 9 p.m., I am going to list every single negative thing about me that is in the public domain. Every single thing that you can find in hours and hours of negative Google searches about me, I am going to bring to the listener's attention to save you the trouble. Because you don't have to go to the New York Radio Message Board or to Facebook and say, oh, don't listen to Frank. He's a, he's a political hack who wastes uh, Yes, I money. am a political don't hack. Frank. Yeah. So um, my favorite, my favorite name for you, and I, you know, I, you must use it. But my favorite name that you're quoted in the press as is political gadfly, Frank Morano, gadfly. If you look up gadfly as a word, you'll crack up laughing. Did we lose? Frank? <laughs> Yeah, I got you now, John. Okay. Yeah, I like the political gadfly. You know, I always send it to you when they write it. But why are you a gadfly? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good one. I got to find... Uh, you know, the Staten Island Advents, they, they were always the ones that would call me a gadfly. But I have to I have to see now that they have a paywall if I can still access those articles. But, uh, but yes, that's a popular one. Frank, I'm sure you know, but today we booked basically no guests. And I'm asking different you know, friends of the show and stuff to call in. They message us and send us things. And um, we had Dabby Carreras there and uh, just a little yeah, while ago. Yeah, I saw ago. him. He was great. And um, you're, of course, a special guest appearance. But, you know, this is your show as much as mine. So you come on whenever you want. But um, as a part of the other things that you might want to add to the list of what you're guilty of, um, I was thinking about, like, old stories uh, before I knew about this. But... Um, you are guilty of, you know, running out of gas and at the same time not having one dollar in your pocket to buy new gas. 
Remember, right. That, do you that's remember, right. You do you remember that story? <laughs> I do. No, that's a true story. That was um, that was about about ten and a half years ago, and uh, you came to my rescue. And not only did I run out of gas, uh, but I did not have any money uh, to purchase more gasoline. So. Um, you, you not only paid for the gas, but, um, we went to a gas station. You had your driver at the time, Scott, drive us to a gas station. We filled, um, we, we got a container of gas, but then we got back to my car and our problem was no we had no way, we had no way to funnel the gasoline into my gas tank. So I walked all along Port Richmond Avenue asking business owners and shopkeepers none of whom could speak english if they could give me like a screwdriver and a funnel or even at some point i think i ultimately settled for a paper plate and something to push it but you had um creatively as you always do fashioned a piece of campaign literature from uh, former city councilman ken mitchell into a funnel that you used to funnel the gasoline so you know, I, I believe uh, you've been burned. Yeah, the Frank, burn. we've been talk, you've been talking politics all week, all six hours a day. I just thought maybe we would fool around about the, about the good old days because, and I was telling Dabby, and I you know, said it before, I told you, but I'm literally brimming with pride to be your friend to see um, all the greatness you're achieving. And I know in my heart how hard you have been working for that your whole life. So people should take notice and point to this guy as an example if you ask me i appreciate that unless i'm just a tremendous flop and then uh it's a it's probably an example (laughs) of uh, of, uh, someone to point to as a series of poor career choices all right well you know what they say you know what i mean it's not, you know, look, should I do a Joe Biden right now and forget the quote? But, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not how hard you go down. It's how fast you get up, you know? And, I uh, like it. So I like it. I'm not, a, like I'm it. not worried. No I'm not worried either way. Thanks for calling in. And, um, you know, if you see anything objectionable, you know, anytime you just, you know, call right in. And I'm looking forward to hopefully next week on WLIR, where Frank is broadcasting right now um, out to Hampton Bay's. Um, I'm hoping to be on the Three John panel again next week. Well, he looks good frozen in just that position. He's pondering whether or not he's going to let me come on next week. But uh, nah, that's the great Frank Morano, my buddy. And uh, if you sh- if I showed, he used to host a show when he was like ten on CTV here in Staten Island. It was called Morano Vision, and I still right. have him in my phone till today as. Murano vision because he has quite the vision buddy thank you so much you're the bomb i love you thank you john i'll see you tomorrow hopefully see you saturday yes sir all right brother we'll take a quick break come on back right after this with uh, another hour of liquid lunch for more liquid lunch head over to youtube do a search for liquid lunch tv and hit that subscribe button And away we go. Um, one of my favorite guys of all time, Jackie Gleason. I don't know if you even know this, but um, The Tonight Show, which you know everyone remembers, most of us remember from Johnny Carson, it actually started with Jackie Gleason. And Jackie Gleason is one of my comedic and performance idols. His body language, his facial expression. Whoa. You know, um, I love that guy, so, and that was one of his, and away we go, is how he used to start things. And then, you know, I'm actually playing around with the thought of asking Frank or someone who has a really uh, unique voice um, to do, like, an intro for me. Here's Johnny, you know, like something like that. Maybe Nico will do it for me. You want to do it, Nick? Here's Johnny. You want you want me to do that now? No, 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 no. I meant, meant like to make a little change the intro to the show because people are probably so sick of watching the same crap that you won't even use any creativity and get some new stuff going there. So I was thinking about an intro like here. That used to be the Tonight Show open. Johnny Carson, Ed McMahon would say, "Here, 
Put a little something together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that means he's going to call his buddy who made the new liquid lunch, JPE uh, <laughs> new liquid lunch full screen. That's right. I'm a delegator. <laughs> oh, you just only want to be heard. You see, there's a camera on him right now, but he doesn't even want to show it's himself. Th- <laughs> it's too dark. You can barely see. It's so dark in this in this house. <laughs> Why don't you put the lights on? That might help. All right, listen, we're uh, breezing through the second hour here, and um, I have put out a plea to Frankie to rejoin us if he can, just to have some fun. But I did, you know, uh, we didn't get the full story right there. And Frank is so near and dear to me. You have no idea, right? And and. Uh, <laughs> but, it, you know, as I do, we all have our shortcomings, and um, we're driving around on election night. Yeah, guess what? I actually ran for office. A lot of people, I put posts on Facebook, and they go, run, Johnny, run, Johnny, run. Uh, I ran once, and I got clobbered, just so you know. And I ran as an independent because I'm an independent type of guy, and independents really can't win. But I ran, and I got clobbered. In a seven-person race, I came in fourth. So... You know, I'm like mediocre as a candidate. But we put on a hell of a show. I worked my butt off. Um, I got a different voice out there, message to people, which is important. And without Frank and Joe Borelli, actually, New York City Councilman, minority uh, whip in the New York City Council, chairman of the uh, Trump New York State Re-election Campaign Committee, Joe Borelli and Frank Morano were my campaign managers. Okay, so I had the dream team going back then. Still came in fourth. Um, Frank and I were driving around um, working on the campaign. I think it might have even been election night. Um, and we're in his car. And as we're driving, it was... <laughs> oh, man. I'm out of gas. What? Who runs out of gas? Like, oh, so we pull the car over. And um, then I said, all right, well... You know, we were just past the station about a few blocks back. We're going to have to walk over there and get some gas. And um, he says, well, uh, I don't have any money on me. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. How could you be driving around in a car with no gas and no money in your pocket? What if you, I, I don't know. But he is quite the creative kid. But I remember that night saying, wow, this guy, he's got it. He, he don't care. He, he's going to roll with it. And... Uh, one of the finest craps players around, and hopefully he and I can get near a crap table this weekend and throw a couple of... I'm going to talk about someone I know, my friend Adriana yesterday, was telling me that there's this whole new craze, this crazy thing, um, that people are entranced by um, people who talk really low, like this. And they do these Facebook videos where they talk like this, YouTube videos where they talk really low. Yeah, you're talking about ASMR. Yeah, ASMR. And then they go, that was the sound of a martini glass hitting the Captain Morgan. Yeah. And um, this is the sound of a shaker opening. Oh, thank God Frank's back. <laughs> Nico is getting so mad just now. <laughs> no, Frank, I don't know if you heard about this, but my friend Adriana was telling me yesterday that there's this new thing, ASMR, where people do videos where they talk like super low. Yeah, yeah, no, this is big. I've played these videos on the radio. Uh, well, I've played the audio of the videos on the radio, and I actually have some ASMR headphones at home. It's not really my thing. I, it doesn't have the same effect on me that it does on others. <laughs> I don't even get it. She was trying to explain it to me. She was like, well, um, the lady w- w- puts her nails on her teeth and says, this is the sound of porcelain, and she makes the sound. I'm like, why would anybody be sitting there watching that or listening to that? I don't know. Well, don't get no, it. you listen to it. It's supposed to be soothing to your brain and soothing to your ear, your your auditory senses it's almost like um, a massage for your brain and for your scalp a lot of people scalp. Describe it. this scalp needs a massage like nobody's business look at this wig i'm working with today Yeehaw! i thought i was Last going golfing year, so i could go hat here 
<laughs> last year during the Super Bowl, they had an ASMR commercial. I don't remember what the product was, but that's when I first learned about it, when they played this ASMR commercial last year. Oh, the so calm? If, the calm? I think so. Like where you somebody, just hear the water running? I don't, I don't remember which one, but I remember it was a big <laughs> deal at the time. <clears throat> Got it. Yeah, Frank, I don't know if you were listening, but I was... Was that election night when we were driving around in the car? Um, which, which, I, I was not listening. Um, which, which time? No, on the gasoline night. Was that election night? No, it was the, um, it was the Saturday or the Sunday before election day. Ah, okay. So we were close. No, I was just telling the audience, giving them a little more backstory on that, that, you know, because a lot of people, when I put stuff on Facebook saying, we got to change this, they say, run. Bill Marco is always writing, run, Johnny, run. And other people say, run. And I'm trying to point out to the audience who doesn't know, I ran. And I lost significantly. I came in fourth in the field of seven. I um, know, but you know what? I think a lot of your base is the, first of all, you got put on the ballot the day before the election. Second, a lot of your base is the South Shore of Staten Island. And uh, you, you, none of those people were eligible to vote for you. You ran in the North Shore of Staten Island. So I think if you were to run a race in the South Shore of Staten Island or an island-wide race or, um, you know, who knows, maybe even a, a race that is of wider jurisdiction uh, and those South Shore tobacco-holics could vote for you, I think you need to <laughs> That's a great name. Maybe I should just register as a Democrat. And run for New York State Assembly in Staten Island and try to see if there are really tobaccoholics out there who will vote for me. I think it's going to be, first of all, it's too late for this year. Um, it too is? Too late to get on the ballot. Yeah. Oh. But I think if you, um, if you were to uh, run this year, you'd see in the South Shore such a high turnout for Trump that whoever the Republican nominee is, and in the South Shore it's uh, Assemblyman Michael Riley, uh, former police officer himself, he uh, is going to win so overwhelmingly that, it, you know, just because of the Trump coattails, if nothing else. Yeah, no, I don't want to go against Mike Riley. I saw him the other night. He actually showed his face, which was, you know, it's daring for these people to come out, even as electives, it's daring for them to come out and support cops, right? Because with all this craziness. But, you know, at the Boost the Blue rally the other night that Scott had, um, Lanza was there, he gave a great rousing speech, Nicole was there, um, and Mike Riley was there, and Tenusis was there, and Daguerre was there. So, you know, Max Rose shows up over there, Frankie, for the defund the police, and then the people we care about and care about our community show up to be with the police. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a sad situation, but uh, hopefully uh, there comes a point where the voters of New York City eventually get frustrated and decide they want some new new style leadership yeah like maybe john katz and he's he's got some decent moderate bona fides too he, he yeah that would be great we might be a bloomberg giuliani moment where john could come in and actually save the city like trump did four years ago that yeah. would be beautiful all right well the point i was making when i was talking about my old campaign was Boy, wasn't I lucky. And boy, didn't I have at least a good eye for talent because I had Joe Borelli, city councilman, minority whip, and uh, chairman of the New York State Trump campaign, and Frank Morano as the two guys leading my campaign. Boy, was I lucky. That's for sure. That's for sure. And uh, we had a lot of fun. We may not have gotten a lot of votes, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> That's my buddy, Frank Morano. Thanks for calling back in and doing double duty, buddy. We'll take a quick Absolutely, break. John. Love Enjoy you, the weekend. See you tomorrow, okay? Yeah, I'll see you then. We're going to take a quick break and come back with hour two right after this. Double. Welcome back, folks. I've been taking my makeup off every day. With, uh, with the coronavirus wipes. I'm still corona fake. Didn't you even wipe your fake thing off? You're not even going to believe this. The viewership is going crazy ever since I started whispering into the microphone. And the, uh, the uh, sounds of different things like 
that's a bell on my desk. Anyhow, I'm joking around, but I don't know. I'll do anything to get people to watch the show because you know what? I tell Nico to put it on Facebook sometimes, and he doesn't always listen to me. Here and there, he listens to me, and then sometimes I come in and Jess has him in a headlock, you know? Um, and then he listens to me because Jess is the boss. She runs stuff over here, and especially when she comes in with her hair curly, then forget about it. She's like, I call her Medusa. But uh, in any event, um, we're having a great time on this Friday. And um, when I came into the segment, I was slugging down my uh, Captain Morgan spiced rum and Coke, which is delicious. And no one even posted one picture. If, you, if you're drinking a drink with me, put it in the stream. I want to talk about it. But um, a very um, new friend of the show, Noal, who just found out about it recently, just texted me. And uh, we're bringing on our resident funny man in one minute right here. But she just texted me. She's watching. And she said, your sense of humor is priceless. I ain't kissing your butt, hyphenated, um, and I'm a tobacco-holic, so Frank might be onto something, starting the tobacco-holics. Maybe I have to, maybe that's the thing to do. I'm, I'm definitely coming out with my own spiced, uh, spiked salsa, or maybe a spiced spiked salsa, and I'm coming out with, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, but I'm just telling you guys first, I'm coming out with a vegan spiked seltzer. It's gonna be so good. And it's gonna be vegan. And it's gonna be organic. And no animals will be harmed in the production of it. And I'm gonna put all that on the can so all these crazy liberals think, oh, let's buy the vegan spiked soda. And it's not even gonna be vegan. We're gonna put pork juice inside. <laughs> Nah, I'm kidding. Uh, all serious aside, I am, me, my brother Todd, and my brother Derek are seriously working hard on a recipe right now to come out with the Three Brothers uh, Spike Salsa. That's that's really happening. And my, my friend Bull, um, Todd's roommate from college, one of his best friends, one of the best horse handicappers in the world, um, owns the Green Hook Ginsmith, and he's going to be helping us with that. Now, I just made myself crack up, which is a little narcissistic to laugh at your own jokes, but uh, I'm going to sit back and relax now because our resident funny man comes in every Friday for a funny Friday. It's Barry Goldsmith. He's the best of the best. He's the host of the Been There, Haven't Done That podcast, professor at NYU and everything else, but uh, number one funny man. And uh, how are you, Barry? What's happening, brother? Hi. Uh, hi, John. You're a funny guy. Uh, as they tell uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, don't sell yourself short. Ah, um, bum Let me ask you this. Um, sure. A lot of talk about this 4th of July. Trump went to Mount Rushmore. When Obama went there, they said, ooh, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's majestic. He looks so grand. When Trump goes there, they're like, this animal, no one had masks on. It's a, it's an insult to the indigenous people. Of like, double standard uh, all the way. What do you think of the recent 4th of July celebration at Mount Rushmore? That was fake media. They were saying that the crowd was not practicing social distancing. But they were. The crowd was more than six feet away from the figures on Mount Rushmore. I mean, they were like 600 feet away or more. So that's fake media. And besides, they were showing old photographs of Mount Rushmore, the four presidents' faces in the background. Because as you can see now in, in the photograph, this is what they really look like. Even the faces of the four presidents. Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I like that. All right. He's a clever editor, too. So um, moving along, um, there are um, Michelangelo's famous statue of David. Um, is uh, It's with Andrew Jackson on uh, oh, Lafayette Square. Why are there fig leaves on those statues? Well, first of all, in the 19th century, there were fig leaves on most of the naked statues, especially of men's parts. There are still many in the Vatican today. So here's my idea. What you do is you take a fig leaf over the faces of statues <laughs> that are literally incorrect. And you know what? They, they, just like a mask covers the lower half, a fig leaf can be big enough 
to cover the whole face. You, you cover the face with a fig leaf, and then you, uh, you take down the sign, the plaque, and no one will know who it is. All and right, you're, 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 however, you're a professor. We all know how, how smart you are. I'm hitting you with a pop quiz right now. Who was the richest man in Victorian England? It's the manufacturer of fig leaves. Ah, okay? You go to every museum. This guy, so, you uh, old so-and-so yeah. you. <laughs> in fact, uh, here's my idea. You know, my father ground bronzed my baby shoes when I was a kid because he thought that they would last longer when I wear them and wouldn't wear out. So here's what I think. Take a look, take a look at this next video. Let me see what's happening okay. here. Let's see what's happening. What do we got? What is Big Newton doing with all their fig leaves? Oh, <laughs> wow. And the, and the hits just keep on coming. Da -ding. That's exactly. a double banger. And John, do you know where Fig Newtons got their name? From a statue in England called Fig Sir Isaac Newton. Everybody <laughs> knows that. Did you know that? <laughs> I did not know that. But you should have put, when you and Nico made up those little graphics, you should have put the Fig Newton over Sir Isaac Newton's head. And if Jess and, was involved, she probably would have came up with that because she's quite creative. But let me ask you this, Barry. Um, sure. They're removing statues. And it's yeah. really, really, really hitting me hard when they're ripping down Christopher Columbus because this is one of my only Italian heroes that I got as a half Irish, half Italian guy. I looked up to Christopher Columbus. Wow! A Ginzo oh, like oh. me found the place. I know. What the heck? It's, it's crazy. Is this going too far? Are they removing statues? Is this going too far? Yes. And the next thing they know, they're going to move Columbus, Ohio to Spain. I mean, this is just getting <laughs> totally out of hand. As a matter of fact, you know, Stonewall Jackson, they're removing his statues all over the South. Here's what I think. Take a Stonewall Jackson statue, move it to southern Texas and rename it. A uh, border wall, Jackson. Oh, of Stonewall Jackson. right. He's not. We don't. We don't. We don't build walls out of stone anymore. We build them out of steel. U.S. Oh, steel. Okay. And um, you know what? It you is indicated. What? It is indicated to me here on my notes, which I very rarely look at or pay attention to, which ticks off Nico. But it said, Goldsmith has several lines here. We have thirty seconds left. Can you throw us some of those severals? Oh, okay. Another thing they're going after now are statues of Jesus. I mean, when you, no, I'm not kidding you. Even in Israel, okay, they keep all the statues of Jesus. Of course, they put yarmulkes on them first. <laughs> oh. And, you know, they're going a bit too far, and I'll tell you how they're going too far. So are you! <laughs> the ASPCA wants to cut down get rid of statues in the nativity of the animals. Oh. I mean, you can't get more picky than that. I no. Mean, what's going on here? All right, stop it. You're going to kill me. I can't laugh anymore. You're the best. We got to run right here, but uh, I'll see you next week. You. And keep the jokes coming. I'm funny because uh, of this guy, okay? Believe me when I tell weekend. you. And a week from Saturday Bye. is Greek Orthodox 4th of July. Remember... John Cronkite joins you again. Wow, the show's just turned into a crazy freak show now. It is Freaky Friday, actually. Right. We need more people like Senator Andrew Lanza. We really do. Because, uh, you know, last week I was talking about, um, you know, how the crazy to cancel culture is getting. They came for our whole food family. You know, they went in the cabinet and they took out Uncle Ben. Then they went in my fridge. They took out Aunt Jemima. Then they went down to the freezer. They pulled out the Eskimo by. Circle back. Come for the Land of Lakes butter, girl. Okay? And Jess went out to ShopRite last week to see if it was real. And there's a whole thing of Land of Lakes butters with... Remember the little Indian? The little cute Indian? The little fe one feather sticking up. Hee <laughs> hee. Hello. She's gone. Lando Lakes is now just a landscape now. So they should just call it landscape butter because that's all they got there. 
Filling in for John Tobacco, John Cronkite, he's uh, clearly lost his mind today. He's doing all these ridiculous things. And um, let me take over the rest of this segment for him. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of news breaking in the city, in the country, in the world. And uh, this just in. Breaking. <laughs> I can't even do it. Breaking news. Amazon. Now, you may recall that right here on Liquid Lunch, we do deep investigative reports. <laughs> I can't even do John Cronkite today. It's like, Hold on. We do deep investigative reporting. We had on Karen Turk yesterday, who goes behind the headlines. And uh, we, oh, we've been talking about TikTok, as you know. And I've been saying that it's a Chinese spying tool. I believe Jess, who just handed me this paper right here, has some breaking news. Jess, what's happening? So Amazon is making its employees delete the Chinese-owned app TikTok from their phones, citing a national security risk. And Amazon and TikTok have not yet responded to requests to comment. Wow. OK, that, that, you know what? I. Um, my associate, Mr. Tobacco, was fooling around a bit there, but this is re some real news, folks. And um, when I tell you um, that we've been looking at this in depth, I have been looking at this seriously in depth. And now it just breaks the news right now. The U.S. military has asked all soldiers to do not put TikTok on their phone. And now, if you think about it, folks, and all of you out there in America, please think about this deeply. Um, the government of China, the Communist China Party, owns TikTok. And now Amazon, your most favorite e-commerce site, has told all of their employees that they have to eliminate TikTok from their phone. So now let me tell you this. I do not have the dossier of uh, technology and entrepreneurial magnificence as Mr. Tobacco. Um, but I can tell you this, everyone in the world trusts Amazon for having some of the finest technology out there. You feel safe, you feel secure, you order things, they show up, they're at your door. If they don't work, you send them back, they send you a new one. If anyone knows the threat of technology, it's Amazon. And Amazon has now told their employees to delete TikTok from their phones. This is going to be terribly devastating news for John Tobacco's daughters who love TikTok. Um, Amazon has asked its employees to delete the Chinese-owned video app TikTok from their cell phone, citing security risks, according to a company email sent on Saturday. And um, let's see, TikTok, which has been popular with young audiences, is owned by the Chinese tech company ByteDance has been under scrutiny from Washington because of its ownership. Mike Pompeo, fellow Italian like Mr. Tobacco, Secretary of State, said on Monday that the Trump administration is considering blocking some apps, which he calls a threat to U.S. security. So for those of you out there who like to do a little tick-tock dance, um, find a new app. Because China owns TikTok and they are uh, infecting your phone, they're stealing your data, and uh, you can wake up one day and your bank accounts and all of your passwords can be stolen and you could be poor. And uh, if there is civil unrest in America, it makes us much more vulnerable. So uh, the murder hornets were coming our way, but they stopped those. They did send the Wuhan virus here, often referred to by our great president as the Kung flu. So the flu came, and then the 5G network is coming. Also, the Chinese government owns Radisson Hotel Group, so don't stay in a Radisson. They're putting in the Huawei 5G network around our country. And if you stay at a Radisson, and you have a TikTok on your phone, and you're at a 5G network in some rural area of America, you are a pawn of China, and they have all your information. So. I uh, continue to try to take over more time in this show so that I can bring you real news. Jess, thank you for breaking that news. She's a wonderful news lady. And um, 
I guess John Tobacco will be back after this. I'm not sure. I sure hope not. Maybe we can even get the great Frank Morano to come back in lieu of Mr. Tobacco. But in any event, I'm John Cronkite, and that is the breaking news for now. We're going to take a quick break for our local sponsors. We have none. And we will come back right after this. Let's end. I always talk about, you know, watching stocks and you want to close above all time highs on a Friday because then that marinates over the weekend and everything. Wow, they had a lot of viewers and then Monday more people tune in. Um, help us break 30. I'm trying to do everything I can, including whisper into the microphone so that I can draw in some wacko audience. All of a sudden, we're down three. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm not whispering anymore. Do not, if you ask me, it's 2 o'clock. We got 30 seconds left. I'm going to tell you this. If this market closes under the number 26,000, anything below that, run for the hills. Do not put on any new positions before 4. And if it looks like it's going to close that way, take the money and run. Keep your eye on Overstock.com coming into next week on a rocket shot. Data dog as well, D D O G from my friend uh, from my friend uh, Joey Hagen, and uh, thank you all for being there this whole week. You're the best. You're a pisser, and uh, we'll be back again Monday, uh, same bad time, same bad channel. <laughs>